So it was a few months ago, me and my wife decided we needed us a new mattress. Have you been mattress shopping? Have you ever done that? You want to talk about being overwhelming. Of course, I'm, I'm introverted, uh, and so um, as a melancholy, I have to do all kinds of research on mattresses before I buy one. I mean, they're expensive, right? So I went to the trusty internet and looked at all these different websites, had all these different mattresses. And, and we went to the store, finally had an idea of what we wanted. We went to the store, and you want to talk about overwhelming. I mean, the number of different mattresses and styles and, and, and hardnesses and softnesses, and they have cooling mattresses now. They have, they have, what, the memory foam. They've got the old inner spring. I mean, they have just got a little bit of everything. Uh, there's a booming sleep industry, if you haven't realized it. I mean, it, it really began by the, the idea and the, the understanding that we are in a public health crisis. And, and a chronic lack of sleep is contributing to our public health problem. And that's the reason why this whole, there's whole industries that have popped up in response. Uh, mattresses are just one. I mean, they have sheets now that you can buy that are supposed to make you sleep deeper, you know. And they have specific pillows and, and all kinds of things. They've got pills you can take. Melatonin, you know, you make sure you get your melatonin, you know. Or, or they have sleep aids, and they've got herbal teas now. You know, you sit around and drink your herbal tea with your pinky up before you go to bed. I don't know. But they've also got, uh, anybody got an Apple Watch? Well, you got an Apple Watch, it, it tracks you. Did you know that? I mean, it'll track your sleep. It'll track how good your sleep is. We have one of those little uh, Alexa devices, and you can tell that Alexa device to uh, play music that'll put me to sleep or play sleep sounds. And, and so you can have like the sound of a thunderstorm going outside. Anybody, thunderstorm put you to sleep? Yeah. You know, you can, you can have that playing on your Alexa. Or you can have like, I, for me, I was raised, I don't know if anybody knows about my background, I was raised in an in 18-wheeler. A I mean, that's really where my background is. You know what puts me to sleep? A diesel engine. Well, that don't work too good when you're married. She don't care about listening to the diesel engine idling, you know, so I have to forego that. I've, I've resorted to a fan. But there's been this whole industry that's popped up around trying to get good rest. And, and corporate employers have even bought in. In 2008, a survey from the National Sleep Foundation found that there is 34% of U.S. companies allow a nap time. Anybody work for one of those? Anybody, anybody get a nap time in your office? I mean, these are offices that have designated nap rooms. Are you feeling me? I'm thinking I could take that fireplace room and kind of transition it into like a nap room. My sister worked for an advertising agency in Kansas City. And, you know, advertising agencies, a little liberal on the cutting edge of, they're very progressive, you know, and everything that they're attempting. They come to the conclusion that, hey, we'll we're, and they brought my sister in, and they said, hey, we're going to give you $15,000 to design a nap room. Here's the office that you're going to use. Spend that money and make it a nap room. And it's caught on. Google has a nap rooms. Facebook has nap rooms. Uber, Ben and Jerry's, they all have nap rooms that are designed for the employee. And you go... You know, they've all got connected schedules and calendars and all this, and you go online and you schedule your time in the nap room. And once you finish, the next person goes in. There, there's, there's even a business that has popped up that makes devices specifically for this purpose. It's called Metro Naps. It looks like an egg. It sits on this little pedestal, and you get in, and the egg comes down over you, and you get to take a nap. You've got music and ambiance to put you to sleep. And they've been experimenting with this idea of good rest to increase productivity for, for decades. It's, it's not necessarily a new phenomenon. You guys got a nap room down at the school? You probably need to think about that. We got a lot of teachers in here. How many of you teachers would like to see a nap room? Yeah. I, but you know what's so weird is when we were in preschool or kindergarten, it was nap time. We hated it. We didn't want it. But boy, we sure would like a nap time now, right? 
In, in 1793, France, the country of France, they actually wanted to increase human productivity. And so they de-Christianized their calendar. They, they modified that seven-day week to a ten-day week. And they, they redesigned the clocks. And they reinvented the time, how the time worked to reflect this new week. And it was a complete failure. You know what happened? Suicide rates increased. People burned out. Productivity actually decreased. I, I read an article recently about how uh, Great Britain is, is experimenting with the idea of a four-day work week. Now, there's a lot of us that would kind of dig that, right? A four-day work week where you don't work Fridays anymore. Problem is, you still have a Monday. Right? That, that's the bad part. But they're doing an experiment in England about decreasing the number of hours that workers work in order to increase productivity. So far, the results have been positive. But you know, it turns out things like what happened there in France when they extended the work week and went to a 10-day work week from a 7-day, and it, and it basically all just kind of cratered. It turns out that humans are not made to work 9 days and rest 1. We were designed to work six and rest one. The, the seven-day period, there's a natural rhythm to that. that I mean, that was, that's, that's coded into our DNA, this idea of a seven-day rhythm. It, I mean, it's sacred. This isn't something that we come up with through human ingenuity. I mean, this, all that, that seven-day cycle, work six, take one off. That is just simply a reflection of God's brilliance is what it is. And that's what we're doing is we're talking. I, me, me and Ben sit down and kind of put our heads together and begin to think about what are some questions that people have that maybe are in the church or the, that, that have to do with the church that people always think, I should know the answer to that, but I've been a Christian for a long time and I'm afraid to ask because I don't want to look stupid. And one of the questions that I always had was, well, what's the deal with a Sabbath? Uh, what is I mean, you read about it. It's in the Ten Commandments. What's the deal with the Sabbath? So basic background for you and your understanding of the Sabbath. The, for the Jews, the Sabbath was everything. I mean, it, it held an incredible importance. It was a sign of the covenant because God had given it to them and them alone. They, God had etched it into the Ten Commandments. When Jesus comes along, it becomes a hot-button issue a, a source of contention between the religious leadership and Jesus. And, and the conflict between those two parties often revolves around the Sabbath. That's where a lot of their arguments stem from is Jesus doing something on the Sabbath. If you have your Bibles, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Genesis chapter 2. I want to read a verse there, then we'll go over, read something out of Exodus, and then we'll finish up in Mark. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. Very short. I've got it on the screen if you want to read along. Here's what it said. It says, So the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. And on the seventh day, God had finished His work of creation, so He rested from all His work. And God blessed the seventh day, and He declared it holy, because it was the day when He rested from all His work of creation. Now, here's a question I want to ask, okay? Okay. Why did that happen? Why did God, the creator of the universe, God Almighty, why did He need to rest? Well, He didn't need to. He chose to. And here's the reason why. It's, it, it's not because He was tired. I mean, he, He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's all-powerful. It's an absolute possibility for God to grow tired. He doesn't have physical bodies like us. He rested because he considered his work complete. That's one reason that he rested. The second reason he rested is that he rested to leave us an example to follow. It, he, he did something to establish a pattern for his creation. Us, those that came after Adam and Eve. Rest is to be woven into the rhythm of our life. If, you've, if you're taking notes, number one there on the back of your sheet, God designed the Sabbath as a day of rest. 
And he knows how stupid humans can be, all right? God knows that, and for that reason, he etched it into the Ten Commandments. Rather than it just be an oral tradition that's passed along, God knew that we were going to need hard evidence and and hard reasoning to get us to take this rest. He put it in the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20 says this, Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons, your daughters, your males, your female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them, but on the seventh day he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart. You see, God knew uh, humans have this incredible capacity to read something and then try to figure out some sort of back door, right? Right? We got to figure out where the where the loopholes are, how we can get out of following that. Uh, that we can follow it in theory, but we can subvert the spirit of the law. That's the reason why he went through all of that and said, "Your sons and your daughters." You see, here's here's what God knows about you. What God knows about me, He knows us intimately. He knows us right down to the molecular level, and because He created us. He knows exactly how much our bodies can take. Uh, Anybody, if you ever buy a car and you open the glove box, what's in the glove box? It's the owner's manual, right? If you'll turn in that owner's manual, I should have brought mine in this morning, and look at the back, towards the back of that owner's manual, you'll see the manufacturer's maintenance recommendation. And it will tell you how often you need to change the oil or how often you need to change the filters or how often the transmission needs serviced. You see, the manufacturer, the creator, the designer of that vehicle knows exactly how much work that car can do before it begins to break down. That's what's going on with us in the Sabbath. God designed us. He created us. Knows how He formed us. And that's why He has prescribed somewhat of a maintenance schedule for us. He knows that if we, I mean, we, left to our own devices, we'd work ourselves in the ground, wouldn't we? I know I would. I mean, if there was not a codified, hard line idea of the Sabbath, we would work ourselves to death. And God knows that is a part of our hearts. He knows that we're not good at following rules, even, even if the rule is good for us. We're not good at following those rules, and, and we have a tendency to overextend ourselves. We, we have a tendency that if we have a desire, we're going to work and work and work until we achieve that desire. And God is basically saying, pump the brakes. Take a rest. And, and He does that first thing, by, He does that by setting the example. By taking a rest Himself and saying, if I take a rest and, and I'm impervious to being tired, you need to take a rest too. So he takes this, this through the whole process of creation, and he creates an example for us how to make rest a part of the rhythm of our life. Number two there on your study guide. The Sabbath is to be a blessing and not a burden. You know, 1,500 years after they received those Ten Commandments, Jesus the Messiah arrives. And through his ministry, he begins to challenge our understanding of, his, of God's purposes in the life, in this life. How we've taken things that God has taught us or revealed to us and how we've kind of corrupted them. How we've, we've morphed them into something more. And that's what Jesus does during his time here on earth through his ministry. He provides clarity to some of the common misunderstandings that we have been living with for years that are, have become ingrained in us as traditions, like our understanding of what the Sabbath truly is. If you have your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter, chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. Here's what it says down in verse 23. 
just to give you some background, it's the Sabbath. It is the Sabbath day. And Jesus and his disciples are traveling, which that's a no-no to begin with. You're not supposed to be traveling on the Sabbath. But he's already made enough enemies that he's got a band of Pharisees that follow him everywhere he goes. All they want to do is they, they're just looking for a reason to accuse him of wrongdoing. They want to be able to present him to the crowds and to the people as a lawbreaker. Look at Mark chapter 20, or chapter 2, verse 23. One Sabbath day, as Jesus was walking through some grain fields, his disciples began breaking off heads of grain to eat. But the Pharisees said to Jesus, Look, why are they breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? And Jesus said to them, Haven't you ever read in the Scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God during the days of Abiathar was high priest, and he broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests are allowed to eat, and he gave some to his companions. And then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of the people and not people to meet the needs of the requirements of the Sabbath. The Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. So what we see in the, in the picture, just to kind of bring some clarity to the, what's going on, as Jesus and his disciples are walking through this grain field, they happen to just reach down, and with their hand they just grabbed some of the grain heads from those stalks, and they took it in their hands, and they rubbed it together, knocking off the shaft, and then they popped the seeds in their mouth to eat. And as that happens, the Pharisees see it, and they scream bloody murder. They see it as a violation. Now, they don't see it as a violation that you're, they're stealing from that field owner. Uh, uh, the Jewish law provided that anybody that any time you were hungry, it was permissible to take some of your neighbor's fruit or grain in order to satisfy your hunger. That's not what they were upset about. They were upset about the fact that they had gathered grain with their hand and they had reaped it, and then they had winnowed it with their hands in the whole process, they said they were harvesting. So as, as they see them plucking that grain, it's almost like they're just like little bitty tattletales, you know. It, you're harvesting. You know, you're reaping. You're breaking the law. You know, they have no concern whatsoever of the hunger or the well-being of His disciples. Their only interest is protecting the petty little regulations that made up their hypocritical system of external religion. That's all they're concerned about. All they wanted to do was find evidence of Jesus being a lawbreaker. And whenever those disciples reached down and gathered that grain, they made a big deal of it because it was on the Sabbath. You know, of course, Jesus being Jesus, he counters their, their accusations with biblical support from the life of David. We won't get in that. There's a lot more that goes in that holy separate sermon, but Jesus just kind of counters it and says, all right, you say this, well, what about this? This is what happened, and this is how David, who they held in high regard, and, and so Jesus is saying, David deliberately broke the Sabbath. David deliberately broke the law in order to satisfy his hunger. Why are you making a big deal out of this? I mean, Jesus is no lawbreaker. Jesus, get this, Jesus regularly went to the, went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. In, in Luke chapter 4, it says, as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. Jesus kept, I want, I want just you to get this picture, he kept the spirit of the Sabbath. You see, there's a purpose to the Sabbath. That's what God is interested in us tipping our hat to and, and acknowledging and observing is the spirit of the Sabbath. So what Jesus does is, as he comes on the scene, he keeps the spirit of the law and he completely sets aside all of those man-made re regulations. All of those things that the Pharisees have come up with about what constitutes the Sabbath, Jesus set them aside and said, those things aren't important. It, I'm not so concerned about, about, how you, about the how of how you observe it. I'm concerned with you keeping the spirit of the law. 
And so by, by doing all of this, Jesus is teaching a lesson here. He says that the Sabbath is made for man. Go back to what I said originally. God set it up for you to get rest. For you to have a time where you could just push the pause button. I mean, that is a gift to mankind from God. The Sabbath is meant to be a blessing to you. Not a burden. That's that second point. The Sabbath is meant to be a blessing to humans. It was a gift that was given to us. And in contrast, those Pharisees had taken something that was intended for good and they had turned it into something that was absolutely a burdensome rule that did absolutely nobody any good. In counter to what those Pharisees taught, Jesus is saying, uh, compassion always trumps strict adherence to ritual. He's saying how we treat one another and how we love other people is always going to be more important than following the letter of the law. And so when he's talking about the Sabbath, Jesus is saying this to all of us. Don't get caught up in this whole idea of the Sabbath. And if you want to believe it's a, a Sunday or you observe a Sabbath, that you keep it on a specific day. It's not about a day. It's not. It's about the Spirit. It's about the rhythm of life, of working six days and then taking a step back and saying, I have a day of rest now. You know, it really doesn't matter what day you observe, quote unquote, the Sabbath. The Sabbath isn't a specific day. But there are whole denominations that are completely built around the fact that they believe the Sabbath should be on a Saturday. Now, the Jews, they did observe the Sabbath on a Saturday. There's no doubt about that, no mistaking about that. But when Christ comes, you see that idea of the Sabbath was, was a shadow of the reality of the Messiah to come. And when the Messiah comes, He is resurrected on a Sunday. That's the reason why as Christians, we, we would call our Sabbath, we, we call it the Lord's Day. It actually serves as a Sabbath for us, if you will. But it doesn't matter what day you observe the Sabbath on. If you work, if you work a, a, a schedule that runs from Wednesday to Monday, your Sabbath would be on a Tuesday. You, you work those days, right? And then you take a day off. It's about the rhythm. Jesus is saying, I don't want you to get caught up in the argument and the debate about the letters of the law. I'm more concerned about you doing what we intended to do. Why we set it up like that. That's what I'm concerned with. Paul said that, uh, talked about this. I want to just read something to you. If you have your Bibles, you want to look at it. You can see it too. Colossians chapter 2. This is what Paul wrote about because there was all kinds of stink being raised about the Jews and how they observed on a Saturday and, and, and those early Christians began to worship on Sunday or that, that's their day of rest. Those early Christians called a Sunday. And so there's an argument that's going on in those early churches. Paul addresses it. Colossians chapter 2 verse 16. Here's what he says. Don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink. Don't let them condemn you for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths, for these rules are only shadows of the reality to come, and Christ is that reality. He's saying now that Jesus is here, all that stuff that we did in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, all those laws are now a reality in the person of Jesus. Don't, so don't get wrapped up in the debate about making sure that we, we always observe the Sabbath on a Sunday or always observe it on a Saturday. Jesus is, I think if Jesus was here today, He'd say, I don't care what day you observe the Sabbath. I want you to observe one though. I want you to take rest because it's good for you. But you know why? It, I'm not, even as good as it is to us, right? I mean, even as... Even as nice as it is to be able to take a day and just step back and rest and relax, there has to be an element of the Sabbath where we observe who is the Lord of the Sabbath. That's what Jesus said at the end of Mark. He said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. And that's number three. 
Keeping the Sabbath as an act of worship. This is a very, very simple point. And I, just want, I, I hope it just sinks in. I mean, the human soul needs time and space to commune with its Creator. We need time where we can get away from the distractions and the interferences of this world. You need a Sabbath. You need a Sabbath day where you can worship your Creator. There needs to be one day a week where we gather to gather in the Lord's house. We leave behind all the hustle and bustle of this world. And, 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 it's, and it's... You ever take your car and put it on an alignment machine? You know, because it tracks. You know, after time, you'll notice your car will start trying to drift into the right or drift into the left. You take it into the shop and you get it realigned. I think that's what happens to our souls on, on Sundays or the Lord's Day or whatever day you're observing the Sabbath is that you just kind of go in and get a little tune-up, right? You kind of, your, your body and your soul and your mind, you realign your purposes with what the Lord's purposes for your life are. I mean, you silence the sounds of business. You silence the sounds of work. And you take time just to listen intently to what the Lord has to say to you. He wants to talk to you. He wants a time where you and Him can commune and, 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 and share. The Sabbath is not meant to be an end in and of itself. The Sabbath points to something greater. And when you observe the Sabbath, you yourself in your life, by your actions, you're pointing to something greater too. It, it, it's a regular reminder that God is the creator of life. And He has designed this this day. And we're going to, I'm just going to push the pause button. This isn't all about me all the time. I mean, this is, a, this is an issue humanity has struggled with since the beginning of time as we somehow believe that we're God. And if you believe you're God, you're going, to, you're going to come to the belief that you don't need a Sabbath. You don't need rest. Somehow we've, we, we try to convince ourselves that everything rises and falls on how productive we are. If I don't work today, my family don't eat, you know? Here's what I think. I think the Lord honors you taking that step back and saying, you want to devote a day to the Lord. And if you're a business owner, and I've been a business owner, there is a huge temptation for you to want to work seven days a week. Because, you know, you're your own boss. You know what bills you have. You, and, and, you know, it's your business. You've got to take care of it. I think the Lord honors those who take a step back and say, we're going to, we're going to just push pause for a second. Do you think there's any coincidence in that and the reason Chick-fil-A is so successful? I don't know. Maybe. You know, Truett Kathy steps back. He creates his little chicken sandwich that it's like little pieces of heaven, right? Those nuggets, I'm, I, I think they're hailstones that they gather, you know, and just... But Truett Kathy stepped back and he said, you know, my chicken sandwiches, how many chicken sandwiches could he sell on a Sunday after church? I mean, he could probably stay open one day a week and make everything he needed to make just off being open on Sundays. But he took a step back and he said, you know what, my God says to observe the Sabbath, and that's what we're going to do. And he could have even said, you know what, I'm going to take a Sabbath day, but my business is going to stay open. My employees are going to work. We don't do that either. He creates space for them to observe the Sabbath. So if you're a business owner or someone has influence in, in your working schedule, I just want to encourage you, build time for your employees to have a Sabbath. Now, Observing the Sabbath is, uh, I, I think it's a little bit of an offering of gratitude, of just saying, hey God, you know, we're grateful for all that you've given us and we're going we're gonna to just set aside our own pursuits in, in pursuit of you for this one day. And we recognize that the Sabbath is your gift to us. And we know that if we refuse a gift from somebody that, that has a gift for us, it can be offensive. So that day of rest, I want to just encourage you that it's a gift from God. It's not another to-do thing that you have to check off your list. 
but take the time to observe the Sabbath. And here's just a, a few practical tips. Just number one, consider how you rest most effectively. I mean, what restores you? What rejuvenates you? I mean, some people may, may get energy from spending the day by going out and dining in a restaurant or watching a movie or taking a hike. Me, I recharge by being alone. I recharge by, by just simply vegging and watching a football game. That's me. There are some people that, um, that need more than that. So consider how you rest most effectively. But take time to worship on the Sabbath. Have a church, a local church that you can plug into. Spend time being around other believers. Spend time reading God's Word and studying His Word. Spend time praying and in communication with your Creator. Number three, get a hobby. Some people, there, there are some wickedly demented people in this world that like to exercise for a hobby. If that's your cup of tea, you go do you, right? I mean, there's some people that like to fish or they like to hunt or they like to cook. I know some guys that their hobby is restoring old cars. That's where they get jazzed up. That's what they love doing. Or they take old pieces of furniture and they sand them down and revarnish them and put them back together and make them work well. Or, you know, find what brings you joy and do that. Okay? And so your Sabbath, in my estimation, should look something like this. You spend time in worship, like we're doing right now. Whenever we leave here, go do something you enjoy. Go do something that, that relaxes you and rejuvenates you and prepares you for the week ahead. If it's taking a nap, I'm all in. Right? Go take a nap if that's, what, if that's what rejuvenates you. But I also want you to do this. Protect that time. Be diligent about protecting your Sabbath rest. I guarantee you there are all kinds of opportunities in this world for you to stay busy. You don't have to participate in everything that comes your way. In fact, I give you permission to say no. Protect it. If you know that I, I get rejuvenated by being by myself and watching a baseball game, or you protect that time when something else comes in, you know that's going to bring a conflict to that, it's okay to say no. But keep the spirit of the Sabbath. Don't get wrapped up in the arguments about what day it should be or making sure that it's a full 24-hour period or all the legalism of the Sabbath. Don't get derailed by that. Keep the spirit of it. Work six, take a day off. And if that happens to be your Wednesday, you take your day off on Wednesday, you come worship with us here on Wednesday night if that's the way it works out. But keep the spirit of the Sabbath and I promise you, God will bless you because He's promised that those who observe the Sabbath will receive a blessing. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this day. Lord, we call it the Lord's Day. We push pause on our lives, of our pursuits, of our desires, of, of our wants to want to go out and gather more and achieve more. But Lord, we, we push pause to come and recognize Your greatness your, and the way that You've designed life. Lord, we want to weave this rhythm of work and rest into our daily lives. And Lord, so I pray for these that are here this morning. I pray that this afternoon would be a time of rest and relaxation for them. Lord, where they can get rejuvenated and, and they can be prepared for the week ahead. And Lord, I'm so grateful that's the way You set things up. Knowing how our bodies are formed and, and the limits that we can push ourselves to. Lord, You're such a loving God. You just you do what's best for us and somehow, Lord, we just have a, a knack for messing it up. But Lord, I pray this morning that the, the truth from Your Word 
comes and it sinks deep in our heart. And we recognize what you've done for us is for our best, for our benefit, and to be a blessing. For it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Hi, thank you for watching. If you want to see more great content like this, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to ring the little bell to be notified when we add new videos. Since our founding in 1877, our goal here at Arnhart has been to create God-centered teaching available for everyone, regardless of their status or station. Today, that looks like making trustworthy Bible teaching available to everyone even if they don't make it to a church building on Sunday. So for more information, check out our website at arnhart.org or join us live on Facebook Sundays at 1045 a.m. As always, we love you and hope to see you next Sunday.